Well, good morning, Discovery Church. It's good to see everybody kept their appointment and is here today. My name is Roly. If you don't know me, um, you may have heard me called by another name, which is, um, oh man, where's Pastor Tim? That's not my name. That's not my name. It's Roly. And uh, today we're going to continue our study in Genesis. And so if you'll join me in Genesis 29, we're looking at Jacob's life. And by now your Bible should just fall open. To Genesis, but we're going to be looking at Genesis 29. But but this part of Jacob's life in, in chapter 29 actually begins in chapter 28. And we to, we're told in chapter 28, verse 11, that uh, he Jacob he re- reached a certain place, and he spent the night. And he had a dream, and God appeared to him, and God repeated the promises that He gave to his grandfather. Abraham and his father Isaac. And then in verses 16 and 17, he woke up and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. But look at verse 17, how it starts in chapter 28. It says, he was afraid. Everybody's been afraid of something at some time. And he's got a brother who is more than willing and able to kill him, has said, I'm going to kill him coming behind him, waiting for the chance. So he's afraid. And yet when he wakes up, when he wakes up, he says, what an awesome place this is. None other than the house of God. And he changes the name from, from Luz to, to the place to Bethel. And um, Pastor Tim told us last week that the name Bethel means house of God. And then Jacob makes a vow. He makes a vow. And when you read it, it says, if God will be with me, if he provides for me, and if I return safely to the Lord, return safely, then the Lord will be my God. And I will give him a tenth of all that you, I will give you a tenth of all that you give me. So when we read it, we see if, if, if. Jacob isn't trying to make a deal with God. That's not what's going on. We can read that word if as the word since. Just like uh, when Jesus was in the wilderness and, and, the, and Satan tempted him and said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Well, trust me here. Satan knows exactly who Jesus is. And he knows that Jesus is the son of God. There was no doubt. So we can read the word if here the same way. Since. Since and Jacob is making this vow, and uh, he he promises to give God uh, a tenth of everything that God gives him. Now he's not making this vow to earn his salvation. He's not earning. He's not making this vow to to get salvation. He is making this vow because of his salvation. That's why he's doing it. It's because of his salvation. And he wakes up and, 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 and he wakes up and he said, this place is awesome. God is in this place. And that's how we should be. He's, he's living his life in awe of God, which brings us to the main idea for today. Live in awe of God. Live in awe of of God. How many of us came here this morning and said, this place is awesome. God is in this place. This is God's house. And he has invited me in here. He's awesome. He's awesome. That's how we should be waking up every day in our house. We should wake up and say, This place is awesome. God has given given us this house. He's given us a soft bed to sleep in. He's given us a soft pillow instead of a hard rock to lay our head on. He's given me the job that causes me to pay all of my bills. He is awesome. That's how we should start every day. God is awesome. And as we move from that into chapter 29, and we we begin to peel back some of the layers, 
We see Jacob that living in awe of God. He's living all in on God. He's living as a new man. He's living different because back in chapter 28, that was the moment, the time of his transformation. It was the moment, if you will, of his salvation. And he's changed. He's living like a new man. Second Corinthians 5.17 tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is, in, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come, and that's what we're looking at, a new Jacob. In verse 1, it, it, we read that, that Jacob resumed his journey and went to the eastern country. The literal translation of resumed or resume, resumed his journey, it, 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 the little, literal translation is he lifted up his feet tells me that he had a little bit of spring in his step. You see, up until now, he's running. He's running scared. But now he's got the promises of God, that God is going to protect him. God said, I'll get you back safe. And so he's got a little spring in his step now. But don't miss this. Even though he has been transformed, even though he is a new creation, his journey continues. Just because we surrender, surrender to Jesus, that doesn't mean the journey's over. That's just the beginning. And that's Jacob is continuing on his journey. And just because we're a new, a new creation, to the contrary, life goes on. But for, because we are a new creation, we have a new way of thinking. We have a new, a new motivation we have a new knowledge, a new protection, a new provision, a new direction, a new spring in our step. In other words, we have Jesus for those things now. We are new creations in him. Jacob finally arrives at a well in Haran. At, he's, in, he's at the place that no doubt he heard his grandfather Abraham talk about a thousand times. Because Abraham left this place 150 years ago, and he, he probably is saying, I remember the time when, and Jacob was probably, yeah, yeah, Grampy, I know, I know, I know. But he's heard it over and over. And there are shepherds by the well, and they got their flocks there. And, and, and Jacob comes up, and because he's a shepherd himself, he, can, he understands what's going on. He calls out to them in verse 4, hey, guys, where are you from? And they say, Haran. That's it. That's all they told him. Haran. What, what's happening is they're giving the stranger, they're giving the new guy the brush off. They're giving him the brush off. See, in Bethel, he learned what God was like. In Haran, he's going to learn what men are like. That's going to be the difference. Verses 5 and 6, they continue to give him the brush off. And Jacob continues to be friendly. He continues to try and strike up a friendship with these shepherds. Matthew 7, 12, Jesus tells us, Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. He isn't treating the other, other shepherds uh, 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 kindly to earn salvation. He's treating them kindly because of salvation. He is living in awe of God. That's what we need to be doing. You see, people are going to be short with you. They're going to brush you off. They're going to be mean to you. They're going to take advantage of you. That's what some people do. Is it fair? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And if you've got kids or, or grandkids or, or you're around them enough, you have probably heard that a thousand times. It's not fair. Yeah, I've, that's the culture now. Our culture is, well, it isn't fair. It isn't fair. Yeah, well, life isn't fair. So you know what? Deal with it. Life isn't fair. But as Christ followers, we do the right thing. Because it's the right thing to do. That's why we do it. Regardless of how people want to treat us. And in situations like this, what we do is we treat them the way we want them to treat us. 
if they want to go the other way with it, that's on them. That's on them. It's not a reflection on you. What other people think of you, whatever, however other people treat you, whatever they say to you or about you, that is not where we get our self-identity and our self-worth from. As Christ followers, we get our identity and our self-worth from Almighty God. That is where our identity lies. That is where our worth lies. You know, somebody, uh, somebody once said, worth, what, what is worth? Worth is what somebody's willing to pay for it. And guess what? Your life was willing to life or was worth the life of Jesus Christ. That's what your life is worth. That's where we get our self-worth from. Not on how people treat us. We get it from living in awe of Almighty God and who he is and what he has done for us. In verse 9, Jacob gets a close-up look at Rachel. And, you know, for me, I, I, think, I think it's love at first sight for Jacob. I really do. And this is where we begin to see God working in Jacob's life again. Again, because he's worked in Jacob's lives before. And Jacob, he's, he's love at first sight with Rachel. And I remember a day in, in March of 1981. I had just started working at the phone company, and I was sitting around the break room and uh, talking with some co-workers. And one of them introduced me to another co-worker that came up. It was, it was a girl by the name of Kay. This past June, that Kay and I celebrated our 41st wedding anniversary. So, yeah, thank you, thank you. I looked at her, and I went, whoa, check her out. For me, it was love at first sight. I don't know about her. I, I really don't. I don't. It took me a while to corral her. You know, um, but but I, I, I don't know about her, but for me, it was love at first sight. She may have a different story. Her story may go like, uh, good grief, if a date is what it'll take to shut you up and get you to leave me alone, I'm good with it. I don't know. You'll have to ask her. She's right back there. There you go. Love you, baby. And that's what's going on here with Jacob and Rachel. Well, kind of. I mean, Kay and I weren't watering sheep, but we were at work. We were at work. Rachel and Jacob, they're at work. It's just an everyday, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, garden-variety day at work. That's what we were doing. And all of a sudden, unexpected, unannounced, God steps into our lives, and he just drops a blessing in our lap. That's what's going on here. Some people say, well, that was a fortunate coincidence for Jacob and Rachel to be at the same well at the same time. But for the Christ follower, there is no coincidence. There is no such thing as luck. These are moments of God extending his grace to us for a better life. There's no accidents. There's no accidents for the Christ follower. That's why you're here today, keeping an appointment. You're not here by accident. You're here by appointment. And when we are living in awe of God, even when life is difficult, even when we have fear or we are afraid, we see these moments for what they are. The God of the universe stepping in and moving on our behalf. And then in verse 12, um, verse 12, Jacob tells Rachel, um, he's her father's relative, and, and she turns and she runs off to go tell her father. Now, I, I don't know about you, but her turning around and running probably would not be the response I would be hoping for. I would want her to stay there. I'm glad when Kay was introduced to me, she didn't turn around and run away. 
Although she may have been thinking that, I don't know. Again, you will have to ask her that. But um, so she turns, Rachel turns and runs and goes, tells her father. And this is where things really start to get interesting. Look at verses 13 through 19 with me. Verse 13, when Laban heard the news about his father's son, about his sister's son, Jacob, he ran to meet him. He hugged him and kissed him. Then he looked, and then he took him to his house, and Jacob told him all that had happened. Laban said to him, uh, you are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed with him a month, Laban said to him, just because you're my relative, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The older was named Leah, and the younger was named Rachel. Leah had tender eyes. Apparently, she's got some kind of an eyesight issue. She had tender eyes, but Rachel was shapely and beautiful. Rachel's the looker. Jacob loved Rachel. So he answered Laban, I'll work for you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban replied, better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay with me. So in verse 13, Verse 13, Jacob meets Laban, tells him all that happened. He says, tells him all that happened. How much of it? Uh, we're not really sure. We, you know, um, one thing for sure that Jacob had to tell Laban is, what are you doing here? He had to answer that question because that would be one of the first questions Laban would have asked. Why are you here? You are a long way from home. So, so he would have had to answer that. And then after a month, Jacob and Laban, they strike a deal. Verse 15, Laban says, you shouldn't work to me, for me for nothing. What do you want to get paid? And without hesitation, no hesitation. Verse 18, Jacob says, I'll work for you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Boom. Let's make a deal, Laban. And then things go from, from that to even worse. Verses 20 through 25, look at those. So Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, and they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. And then Jacob said to Laban, since my time is complete, give me my wife so I can sleep with her. So Laban invited all the men of the place and sponsored a feast. That evening, Laban took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and he slept with her. And Laban, Laban gave his slave Zilpah to his daughter Leah as her slave. When morning came, there was Leah. Oh boy. So, she, so he said to Laban, what have you done to me? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked for you? Why have you deceived me? Jacob worked seven years. And, and he holds up his end of the bargain, and Laban scams him. Laban just flat out scams him, and Jacob marries Rachel's sister, Leah. Yeah, I know. This is like, you know, a weekday afternoon soap opera. Marries Rachel's sister, Leah. Now, now here's my thing. Can you imagine what the scene in Jacob's tent would have been like when he woke up and there's Leah making coffee and scrambling eggs for him and not Rachel? He ran over to Laban and could you imagine the scene in Laban's living room as he busted through the front door of the tent and says, what have you done to me? Why have you deceived me? I just can't imagine. And then, but then we also have to ask ourselves, well, how could he not have known that that wasn't Rachel? How could he not know? Well, she was probably heavily veiled. It was probably dark. They probably didn't have a whole lot of conversation. And, and because she wasn't discovered, it suggests that she was part of this whole ruse right from the, get, from the beginning. And, and so there were some, probably some other things going on to help cover it up. We're not sure, but that's, that'd be my best guess. The writer's telling all of this. He's telling all of this to us to set up verses 26 through 30. Look at verse 26. Now, remember, Jacob said, 
What have you done to me? Why have you deceived me? I'm mad. And he's probably throwing whatever Laban's got around. Okay. And then Laban answered, it is not the custom in our country to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn. That must have hit Jacob like a cold slap in the face. Because remember, what Laban is saying is we respect the rights of the firstborn. That's what he's telling him. And Jacob had tricked Esau out of his birthright. He had tricked Isaac out of Esau's blessing. And now the same thing was happening to him. The writer is telling us that deceit will never meet with the approval of God. Never. Remember Matthew 7, 12. Jesus said, whatever you want others to do to you, do the same to them. Paul puts it this way. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 6, verses 7 through 9. Verse 6. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Verse 8, because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Verse 9, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. That's exactly what Jacob is experiencing here in chapter 29. He is reaping what he sowed. Listen, if you want some respect, sow some respect. You want grace, sow grace. You want forgiveness, sow some forgiveness. You want peace, sow some peace. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. And what you sow is determined by how much your life demonstrates that you are living in awe of God. Not what he can do for us, but who he is. He is our creator, our provider, our protector, our peace, our comfort, our strength, our direction, our rock. It is time for the church to get back to living in awe of Almighty God. That is what the ship, that is the current that will change the ship of our society, is when the church stands up and begins living like that. And in verse 27, Laban says, Complete the week of celebration. Uh, the, the marriage to Leah, complete the week of celebration and I'll give you Rachel as your wife and you will work another seven years from, from, for me. Now look, look at how verse 28 begins. And Jacob did just that. Notice there's no argument. There's no excuse on Jacob's part. There's no argument or excuse to be made. He was reaping what he sowed, and he owned it. He owned it. It was part of his story. We all have a story. And all of our stories have a villain. Satan, the devil, the enemy. But you see, our villain doesn't get to write our story. We are told the Lord is the author and finisher of, our, finisher of our faith. It is God who gets to write and finish our story, not the villain. If you have a sin, own it. Confess it. Get away from it. Turn. Re repent from it. But own it. Because you see, my story, and, and some of you know my story, and if I had time, I, I would tell it again, but I don't. But I have sinned many times. So have you. We need to own it. Because when we own it, and it becomes part of our story, we disarm the enemy. 
He can no longer hold that over your head and say, hey man, you better not let so-and-so find out. You better not let them find out. You better not let them find out or they're going to be all done with you. Man, when God finds out about this, let me tell you something. God already knows. God already knows. And when we can, when we own it, we disarm the enemy. He can't hold that over us anymore. But you see, my story, your, your story, it's not just about our sin. The bigger part, no, no, the biggest part of our story is God's grace in our life despite our sins. That's the biggest part of the story. That's what the enemy doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want you to hear that. Because what that does is that gives you a life transformation. That gives you new life, new spring in your step. Hebrews 8.12, in Hebrews 8.12, God tells us, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sin. The devil tries to deceive us into thinking that our story is over and God is done with you. You are on the pile, the trash pile of life now as far as God's concerned. He's done with you. That is a lie. Hear me. That is a lie. God makes the decision to remember our sins no more. We make the decision to sin. It is a decision that we make. Own it. Own it. Because you have an almighty God who makes the decision to remember it no more when we confess it and we repent of it and we throw ourselves on the altar of his, of his altar for his grace and his mercy. Own it. Own your sin Accept the forgiveness. Accept it. It's part of your story. That is why we should be living in awe of God. Because we serve a God that sees our wrongdoing and says, I'm going to remember it no more. We should be living in awe of him. And then in verses 31 through 35, we see God keeping his promise. Remember, it's been about 150, 160 or so years since God made his promise uh, to Abraham. He, made, he promised Abraham, I'll make you into a great nation. That was back in chapter 12. Jacob met Rachel, thought she would be the one to give him all the kids because she would be the one that I'm in love with. She's the one I'm working seven years. You just, we just went over that. So, so he's thinking that Rachel is going to be the one to give him his son. But verse 31 tells us that she couldn't have children. You see, God saw how Jacob neglected Leah. And what God did was he extended Leah his grace and his mercy. And she was allowed to have the children not Rachel, at least not yet. I don't want to get ahead of the story. God always keeps his promises. It may not be in our time frame or in the way that we thought it would be done, but he keeps them his time, his way. My wife and I prayed 16, 17 years for something to happen. Nothing. He, all of a sudden, walks in and drops a blessing in our lap. He keeps his promises. He says, you can come to the throne of grace for time of need, in a time of need for help. He says, you can do that. Why? Because we belong there. Why? Because we're sons of his. Why? Because we are in awe of him. Do you see we should be living in awe of God? He always keeps his promises. And so, so then we start to see the children born. First one is, is Reuben. And I'm, I'm guessing that he went on to make a really good sandwich. But he's, we got Reuben and we got Simeon and we got Levi and we've got Judah. 
Judah, the one, the, the, the tribe from whom Christ would come, our Savior would come. So we, he, she's having these kids. But, but look what Leah says. This is interesting. Verse 32, she says, the Lord has seen my affliction. Verse 33, the Lord heard that I am neglected. Verse 35, I will praise the Lord. And here's why I find that interesting, because up until now, I've seen nothing that would say um, Leah believes in Jacob's God or even acknowledges Jacob's God. So what happened? Why, why the change all of a sudden? I think that what happened was for the last seven or so years, Leah has been watching Jacob and listening to Jacob talk about the God, his God, and how God promised him and kept his promise, how he's protected him, how he's provided for him. He, he's been living in awe of God, and she's been watching that for seven years. And because he was living in awe of God, the way he lived influenced Leah and impressed Leah, even in these difficult times where she was being neglected by him. That's what's going on, in, in my opinion. You see, because God, even in the difficult times, God sees your affliction. He hears your cries for help. And he loves it when we praise him, even in the difficult times as we wait for him to answer his prayer. We're still going to live in awe of you, God, because you are almighty God. And I'm going to live in awe of you. I'm waiting for you to keep your promise. I know you're going to keep your promise. God wants us to live in awe of him. A life that is all in on him. He wants us to live all in on him. A life all in on God is a byproduct of a life that is lived in awe of him. But see, a life all in with God, that's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. It's it's. It's a pretty popular phrase now, living in all in on God, but that's not the gospel. If anything, the gospel is God all in on you. So much so that he sent his son to die for you, for me. That's the gospel. He wants us to live a repentant life because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. His decision to remember our sins no more. His decision to pay the price for our sins. So let me close with this. Are you living every day in awe of Almighty God? Because He is an awesome God. And we should be living in awe of Him. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? And back in uh, chapter 28, we're told that Jacob came to a certain place. Have you come to your certain place? Are you ready to surrender to him? Are you done chasing something that you're not sure what it is? time to surrender. Have you reached your certain place to surrender to Christ? Because you know what? He's been chasing you all of your life. And if you have surrendered your life and you, you, you are a, a Christian or a Christ follower, have you reached your certain place where you're tired of checking religious boxes and you are ready to begin to rekindle your relationship with Almighty God and begin to live in awe of Him. In a minute, I'm going to be right down here in front while we sing. If you want to surrender 
Would you have the courage to come up here? Let me pray with you. There's going to be people in the corners of the room. If you want to rekindle your relationship with Almighty God, they would be happy to pray with you. I would be, it would be a privilege for me to do that. I'll be right here. If you've never met Jesus, it would be my privilege to introduce you to him. Let's pray. Lord, you are an awesome God. You have just poured blessings out on us. Lord, you sent your son for me. And you have made the decision to not remember my sins anymore. If I just confess them and repent, turn from them. Lord, let this be the day that we as a church begin living in awe of you. That you use us to change our community. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.